Okay. Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to STL History Live. My name is Aaron Pelker, and I'm a Community Engagement Coordinator at the Missouri History Museum. And I do want to thank you for spending part of your Tuesday morning with us. Before we get started this morning, I do have a couple of brief remarks. Uh, first, the presentation will last roughly about 30 minutes, with another 10 minutes at the conclusion for audience questions. To submit a question, please find the Q&A box on the Zoom toolbar. We do ask that you wait until the conclusion of the presentation before you submit your question. Today's presentation is also being recorded, so if you need to step away from your computer or leave the presentation early, we'll upload today's program to the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube page early next week. As always, your feedback is important to us. We'd really appreciate it if you could take a moment after the conclusion of the program to answer a few questions for us. A Kobo toolbox survey will soon open in another tab in your browser, so please keep an eye out for that when you leave the session. Lastly, we wouldn't be able to host programs like today's without the generous support of our museum members and city and county residents through the Zoo Museum Tax District. If you're already a member, thank you for your support, but if you're not but would like to learn more about the membership process, please check the chat feature on Zoom for a URL link to our membership page. So thanks again for joining us this morning. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter, Jamie Barasa, Associate Archivist Digitization at the Missouri Historical Society's Library and Research Center to talk about the literary ladies of St. Louis. So thanks for finding yourself here and enjoy. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, first off, I want to apologize in advance. There are some lawn care guys working outside, so I don't know if that'll be distracting or not, but sorry about the noise if there is any. Um, thank you for joining us today. I am going to talk about a few of the literary ladies of St. Louis, who are Kate Chopin, the novelist, Sarah Teasdale, the poet, and Zoe Akins, who was a playwright and screenwriter. And I also want to note that all of the documents I'm going to show today can be viewed in person at our library if you would like to make an appointment. First off is Kate Chopin, who was a novelist, a short story writer, and a poet. She is best known for her 1899 novel, The Awakening, as well as her 1894 collection of short stories called Bayou Folk. She was born in our city on February 8, 1850, as Catherine O'Flaherty. And the image on the right shows the author when she was about a year and a half. She was the daughter of Thomas O'Flaherty and Eliza Ferris. Her father was an Irish immigrant who came from Galway to St. Louis at, um, in about the 1840s. He was a wealthy businessman who invested his money in real estate and boats, and he also helped to bring the telegraph to Missouri. Eliza came from an old St. Louis family, the Charlevilles, so Kate grew up hearing tales of old French St. Louis from her grandmother Charleville. Uh, Eliza is pictured on the right with her stepson, George, who Thomas had with, with a previous marriage. And the pair had three children of their own who were Thomas, John, and Kate. When they got married, there was a bit of an age difference between them. Thomas was 37 and Eliza only 14. Unfortunately, Kate did not get to know her father for very long. When she was only five years old, he perished in the Gasconade Bridge disaster when his um, train went over the Gasconade Bridge and the bridge collapsed. And he was one of 25 people who died that day. Kate started school at Sacred Heart Academy, which was located at then Fifth and Market Street. She learned everything that accomplished young ladies of the time should learn, such as how to speak French and how to play piano by ear. While she was there, she kept a copy book in which her friends would write out notes to her, she doodled, and she also copied out poems she admired, showing her early interest in poetry. As a teenager, she began keeping a commonplace book um, with extracts from literature and history books. She also kept lists of things she admired, um, like notes on the uh, ruling monarchs of Europe and famous last words of famous people. And she also used the commonplace book to start composing her own original compositions, such as memories, pictured at the top. She graduated on June 29, 1868. And she continued to use her commonplace book as a diary where she would mostly write about how completely bored she was after graduation. 
Um, one example she wrote on December 31st, 1868, rain, rain, rain. I am going to receive calls tomorrow. My first winter, I expect a great many visits. I wish the weather will change. This rain is intolerable. What a nuisance all this is. I wish it were over. I write in my book today, the first time for months, parties, operas, concerts, skating and amusements, ad infinitum have taken up all my time that my dear reading and writing that I love so well have suffered much neglect. She wrote again on March 25th, 1869. I feel like I should like to run away and hide myself, but there is no escaping. I'm, I'm invited to a ball and I go. I dance with people I despise. Amuse myself with men whose only talent lies in their feet. Gain the disapprobation of people I love and respect, only to return home at daybreak with my brain in a state which I never intended for it. Arise in the middle of the next day, feeling infinite, infinitely more in spirit and flesh, like a Lilliputian than a human with a body and soul. I am diametrically opposed to balls, and yet when I broach the subject, they will laugh at me, imagining that I wish to perpetrate a joke, or look very serious, shake their heads, and tell me not to encourage such silly notions. In 1870, Kate visited New Orleans, where she fell in love with Oscar Chopin. They, the pair were married June 9th, 1870, at Holy Angels Church in St. Louis, and Kate was happy about her choice. Uh, on May 25th, she wrote, in two weeks, I'm going to be married to the right man. It does not seem strange as I thought it would. I feel perfectly calm, perfectly collected. After their wedding, the pair embarked on a honeymoon trip that lasted for three months and took them to Europe, where they visited Germany, Switzerland, France, and Italy. And Kate continued writing in her commonplace book um, with daily entries about the adventures they had and the people they met. And unfortunately, uh, she also wrote about how they had to cut their honeymoon short when the Franco-Prussian War broke out while they were over there. So that was some bad timing. Um, it was a happy marriage for Oscar and Kate. They had six children within the first eight years of their marriage who were John Baptiste, Oscar, George, Frederick, Felix Andrew, and Marie Liza. The family first lived together in New Orleans where o Oscar worked as a cotton broker. His business ultimately did not succeed there though. So the family relocated to Clodierville, Louisiana. And Kate absolutely loved living there. She loved the people and the scenery and her experiences while living in there are what inspired many of her later short stories about Louisiana life. For an example, uh, here is a quote uh, where she describes the bayou from her short story, La Belle Zerade. The summer night was hot and still. A ripple of air swept over the marais. Across Bayou St. John, lights twinkled here and there in the darkness. And in the sky above, a, a few stars were blinking. A lugger had come out of the lake, was moving with slow, lazy motion down the bayou. A man in the boat was singing a song. The house pictured above is the home that they actually lived in. It later became the Bayou Folk Museum, dedicated to Kate Chopin, and unfortunately was completely destroyed in a fire in 2008. Kate's happy family life was interrupted when her husband suddenly died of yellow fever in January, 1883. Kate was only 32 years old at the time. She was a widow with six children. And because of Louisiana law at the time, she had to petition to even be named the legal guardian of her own children. In 1884, the next year, she returned to St. Louis so she could be closer to her mother who died the next year in 1885. Now that she was alone and had to find a way to support herself and her children, Kate returned to her beloved childhood hobby of writing. She started publishing poems and short stories in local and national publications. And she also wrote a um, composition for piano called the Lilia Polka that came out in 1888. We have many of her original manuscripts in our archive, as well as two account books where she was very diligent about recording where she sent stories and poems out to, um, if they were accepted or rejected, and how much she earned for each. Her first book, At Fault, was published in 1890. It takes place both in St. Louis and on a Louisiana plantation, and uh, the plot revolves around divorce. In 1894, she published Bayou Folk, which is her collection of short stories. And in 1899, The Awakening came out, which is her most famous work. Originally, it was called A Solitary Soul, and tells the story of a married woman, Edna Pontillier, 
who experiences a personal awakening while vacationing with her family in Grand Isle, Alabama. While she's there, she falls in love with another man. And this opens up a window for Edna to self-reflection and discovering herself and her own happiness as an individual rather than her roles as a wife and mother. And I won't give away too much because it's a very good book and you should all read it. But here are a couple quotes about Edna's awakening. She felt as if a mist had been lifted from her eyes, enabling her to look out and comprehend the significance of life, that monster made up of beauty and brutality. And it sometimes entered Mr. Pontelier's mind to wonder if his wife were growing a little unbalanced mentally. He could see plainly that she was not herself. That is, he could not see that she was becoming herself and casting aside that fictitious self, which we assume like a garment with which to appear before the world. And unfortunately, this book was shocking with a capital S to critics of the time. Uh, reviewers did not like that she was a woman writing about infidelity and about how women experience desire like men. Um, men like Flaubert and Tolstoy had published similar books about infidelity, but they could get away with it because they were men. Women had no business writing about such things. Here is a letter that we have from Kate's friend, Louis B. Eli, about a negative review. He wrote, what in the name of Jupiter did you do when you read the review of The Awakening in this morning's globe? For fear you have not seen it, I enclose it. Provide yourself with ammonia salts, brandy, etc., before you start to read it. You have had or will have hysterics. It doesn't seem very friendly to me. Um, Kate herself was apparently bewildered at the reception to her novel. Uh, she had this quote in Book News, having a group of people at my disposal, I thought it might be entertaining to myself to throw them together and see what would happen. I never dreamed of Mrs. Pontelier making such a mess of things and working out her own damnation as she did. If I had had the slightest intimation of such a thing, I would have excluded her from the company. But when I found out what she was up to, the play was half over and it was too late. Even uh, with the con controversy and possibly because of the controversy, Kate remained very popular in St. Louis. She was asked to read an excerpt from the novel at a meeting of the Wednesday Club. And she also held a sort of salon at her house, um, a weekly meeting for writers and reporters at uh, 3317 Morgan, which is now Del Mar. In 1903, she moved to a new residence at 4243 McPherson, which was only six blocks away from Forest Park. And Kate loved to frequently walk there, especially when the World's Fair opened up in 1904. And unfortunately, this is probably what killed her. It was after visiting the fair on a particularly hot day on August 22nd, 1904, that she died at home from a brain hemorrhage that may have been brought on by heat stroke. She is buried in Calvary Cemetery here. I want to end Kate's section on a quote from her obituary that was written by a local publisher, William Marion Reedy. He wrote, Kate was a remarkably talented woman who knew how to be a mother without sacrificing the comradeship of her children. As a mother and friend, she shone resplendent and her contributions to fiction, though few, showed that she possessed two true literary genius. Her works are literary treasures which she has left and which have afforded many a pleasant hour. The Awakening was out of print by 1906 and Kate was in danger of being forgotten entirely. But fortunately, scholars in the 1960s rediscovered her works and started to realize how important of a voice she was in early feminist literature. So today she is widely read in high schools and universities around the country. All right, our next lady is Sarah Teasdale, who was a lyric poet. Her works focused on emotions and romance and beautiful imagery. She was inspired by 19th century romantic poetry and also classical myths and legends. She was born in St. Louis, August 8, 1884. She's six years old on the picture on the right. And she was born with an H in her name, but a friend uh, later said that she should drop the H and become S-A-R-A because she thought it sounded more like a great poet. Sarah was the daughter of John Teasdale and Mary Elizabeth Willard. Her father worked as an importer of dried fruits and nuts. And she lived at 3668 Lindell with her parents and siblings, John, George, and Mamie. Sarah was the youngest by far in her family. She was a full 20 years younger than her oldest brother, George. 
Because of this, and also because she was very delicate in health since childhood, she was frequently kept indoors. Later writing about her childhood, she said, I was the flower amid a toiling world. Initially, uh, her sister Mamie taught her to read and write and do math at home. And then when she was nine, she went out to attend Miss Ellen Dean Lockwood's school for boys and girls. And she eventually graduated from Hosmer Hall, pictured on the, the top. Her writing talents were recognized early at school and her principal asked her to write an essay to read aloud at graduation, but she was too shy to do so. So she ended up writing the, the class song instead. After school, Sarah became invo involved with a group of young St. Louis women in their teens and early 20s who called themselves the Potters. They were all young artists and writers who were encouraged to meet by St. Louis teacher Lily Ernst, who's pictured on the bottom left. Um, they would periodically meet at one another's houses to discuss art and literature and drink wine, which sounds like a good time to me. Um, the members vary varied at different times. Um, from on the top, from left to right, is Edna Wallert, Inez Dutro, Grace Parrish, and Caroline Risk. And then on the bottom, Lily Ernst, Sarah Teasdale, Vine Colby, Wilhelmina Parrish, and Celia Harris. The group also started putting together a monthly magazine with contributions from each of the members. Each issue was one of a kind, completely hand-drawn and hand-illustrated, included things like watercolor paintings, photographs, designs for household items like uh, scarves and wallpaper, um, short stories, plays, essays. Um, they're all extremely cool. We have 17 of these in our archives and they've all been digitized if you'd like to take a look on our uh, cross-collection search. Sarah, of course, contributed her poetry. These are two examples of her early poems. Um, the one on the top is called Song and took inspiration from King Arthur mythology. And the one on the right is Aneros, where she wrote about her longing for love. William Marion Reedy, the publisher who will keep coming up, um, he heard about the group and asked Mrs. Francis Porcher to write an article about them for Reedy's Mirror. She wrote, it is rare to find a set of girls so nearly equal in their work or so thoroughly in harmony. And about Sarah in particular, she wrote, Sarah Teasdale will be heard from. Hers is the perfect poetic spirit. After the Potters disbanded in 1907, Sarah became more um, serious about working on her craft. Her first book that came out, Sonnets Seduce in 1907, was actually self-published. Her parents uh, funded it. And it was, uh, inspired by actress Eleanor Deuce, whom Sarah admired. And it received okay reviews for a first book. The Saturday Review said, these are little songs for children or about them, as lovely as these and with a quaint humor of their own. The book is a small delightful thing, which one is not tempted to say much about, but to welcome. Her next book in 1911 was Helen of Troy, which also received good reviews. Over the next few years, Sarah was courted by, by various young men, like Vashal Lindsay, who was a poet from Springfield, Illinois. The two wrote to each other and became lifelong friends. Vashal admired Sarah's poetry, and she became a figure in his own as the Chinese nightingale figure. When he learned that she was engaged to marry somebody else, he wrote a letter to his friend, Harriet Converse Tilden Moody, about his disappointment. He wrote, for nine months, the good and beautiful Sarah Teasdale and I wrote to each other, all our minds and hearts, and she is going to marry another man. She was in many ways the most intimate friend I had had for years and the best understanderer. We were just alike in much that it would take Henry James to show. She was hard to give up, and now I have an empty, rattly, hollow pumpkin sort of place where she belonged. The man that Sarah did choose to marry was Ernst B. Filsinger, who was a local St. Louis businessman. Throughout his career, he became an expert on international trade, and he was an author himself of books like Exporting to Latin America and The Commercial Traveler's Guide to Latin America. The pair had a courtship in Charlevoix, Michigan, where Sarah wrote him poems like The Wind of Love on the left. And they were married at her parents' home December 19, 1914. For the first couple years of their marriage, they lived in various St. Louis hotels together. Ernst was a big supporter of Sarah's writing and admired it, and she would often give him drafts of her poems to comment on. 
After her marriage, Sarah's career really started to take off. Her next book in 1915 was dedicated to Ernst. And a love song, probably her most famous work in 1917, won her the 1918 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, which was the very first Pulitzer Prize for Poetry given out. As an example of her poems of the time, I, I like this short poem, Fault. They came to tell your faults to me. They named them over one by one. I laughed aloud when they were done. I knew them all so well before. Oh, they were blind, too blind to see. Your faults had made me love you more. Sarah's next book in 1920 was Flame and Shadow, which she called her favorite of her books. Dark of the Moon came next in 1926. The New York Times Book Review called it exquisite and said that it showed how close Sarah was to attaining art's ultimate goals. Her final two books were Stars Tonight in 1930 and Strange Victory, which came out after her death in 1933. Although Sarah was having great success in her professional life, her personal life was not going quite so well. In 1916, Ernst became the foreign sales manager for Lawrence and Company, which was a textile firm based in New York and Boston. Because of his job, he frequently had to travel overseas for long periods of time. While he was away, Sarah wrote him love letters where she wrote about how she missed him and she worried about his health because she thought he worked too much. They ended up spending much of the next couple decades apart. And Sarah moved around to various locations in the country for, to, for quiet places to rest for her health. By the end of the 1920s, she started thinking about divorce because their lifestyles were no longer in sync. And possibly the final straw was in March, 1929, when Ernst left for a business trip and did not take the time to visit Sarah to say goodbye before he left. Rightfully annoyed, she wrote to her sister-in-law, Irma, and said, he is to be gone about a year. He has come to consider business more important than life. As this place is only two and a half hours from his office, the sacrifice would not have been great. By May, Sarah had decided on the divorce and contacted lawyers in Reno, Nevada, which at the time was the place for a quick, e quick and easy divorce. She wrote to Ernst of her decision on June 1st. She said, after so long a silence, you will not be surprised to learn that I have arrived at the decision announced in this letter. And because of my talks with you over a period of years, you will realize that complete freedom for each of us is the happiest. In fact, is the only solution of our lives. I want you to know that though you have seen me in tears so seldom, I have wept many times when you did not see me. And during the last few months, while I have been coming to the decision, which is absolutely irrevocable, I have wept often. She went on to ask him not to forget the happy times they spent together, but asked that he also not try to get her to change her mind because it would only cause more pain for both of them. Ernst was heartbroken, but he agreed. Sarah briefly moved to Reno so she could establish residence and the divorce papers were filed on September 5th. After Sarah's divorce, her health work took a downturn and her writing slowed even more. She began working on editing a collection of poems of Christina Rossetti, but she never finished it. On January 29, 1933, Sarah was found dead in her bathtub in New York City by her private nurse. Her death was ruled accidental, but in actuality, she had taken a deliberate overdose of sleeping pills. Earlier in her life, she had written somewhat presciently of her suicide by saying, I have sometimes thought that if I ever had to support myself, I should commit suicide. It is so hard for a woman to make even enough to keep body and soul together. And if one is hampered by ill health, one might as well give it up altogether. Sarah left her income to Ernst in her will, and he died a few years later in 1937 and they are buried together in Bell Fountain Cemetery. Sarah's friends remembered her as a lifelong romantic. Vine Colby, a former Potter member, said, her spirit remained fixed at the stage of romantic love. One could no more imagine her otherwise than one could imagine Easold planning Tristan's dinner or getting the children off to school. She lived and breathed poetry. And I want to end Sarah on this poem of hers from Love Songs, I Shall Not Care. When I am dead, and over me bright April shakes out her rain-drenched hair, though you should lean above me broken-hearted, I shall not care. I shall have peace as leafy trees are peaceful when rain bends down the bough, 
and I shall be more silent and cold hearted than you are now. And moving on to our last lady, a much happier story, Zoe Akins. Zoe was the daughter of, or she was a prolific playwright and screenwriter. She was born in Humansville, Missouri on October 30th, 1886, Zoe Bird Akins. Her father, Thomas J. Akins, was a prominent banker, businessman, and politician. And her mother was Sarah Elizabeth Green. She had four siblings who were Freddie, James, Frank, and Marie. In 1898, the family relocated to St. Louis so that Thomas could become the postmaster at the old post office and custom house. And Zoe loved spending time with her father there while he was working. She would sometimes work as a secretary, but often she would just take the time to work on her own writing. Her friend Oric Johns later wrote, it was from the dingy old federal building that most of our plans for improving the universe emanated. She wrote more prolifically and with greater ease than any of us. Zoe attended school in Monticello Seminary in Godfrey, Illinois, pictured in the middle. She loved her time there. She later wrote a novel in 1941 called Forever Young based on her experiences there. And she eventually gra graduated from Hosmer Hall, like Sarah Teasdale. By the age of 15, Zoe was already publishing poems locally in the Globe Democrat and Reedy's Mirror. And she caught the attention of the publisher of Reedy's Mirror, uh, William Marion Reedy, who fell in love with her. About her, he wrote, Zoe Akins is the weirdest girl. She affects dresses very simple and severe and won't wear plumes in her hat. She is preternaturally bright. She writes exquisite impressionistic verse and has the oddest views upon things. She's very young, but as wise as a centenarian and very girlish withal. I haven't said that she is beautiful, but she is at times and is always interesting. They, the pair were engaged when Zoe was 17, but it was a short-lived engagement because uh, Reedy was 42 at the time and Zoe's father was not so excited about that age difference. Uh, Zoe, however, wasn't all that disappointed when her engagement broke off because she hadn't had as much time to write during the courtship. She later said, as soon as I was all at sea again, I began to write again, to write and to throw myself into trivial pleasures among all kinds of trivial people, to go about with other men, for I had tasted the sweetness of personal liberty and was passionately in love with it. From an early age, Zoe loved the theater. She had acted in, her, in plays herself in St. Louis with the Odeon Stock Company, but she preferred writing to acting. Her first play she wrote when she was 17 was called The End of the Strike, and she described it as no more absurd than the average play produced on Broadway. In 1905, she left St. Louis for New York City, initially to attend Columbia University, but she soon wrote home to her parents and said that she wanted to get on with being a playwright rather than, quote, waste time at school. And luckily for Zoe, her parents supported her. While she lived in New York, she learned about the writing craft, made writing friends like Billa Cather, and absorbed the New York culture. Many of her plays were produced throughout the 19-teens and 1920s. Her first big hits were The Magical City in 1916, and also Déclasse in 1917, which starred Ethel Barrymore. Her plays were generally very popular with audiences, but critics sometimes said her works were overly sentimental and criticized that she mostly wrote about the wealthy class. One critic said Zoe was suffering from a suppressed desire to have a butler, and, but another called her the chief romancer on Broadway. In 1929, uh, Zoe followed the call of Hollywood and moved to California, where she became a screenwriter for studios like Paramount, RKO, and MGM. And she is credited for work on many screenplays throughout the 1930s. And once Zoe moved to California, she never went, lived anywhere else. She loved movies and the new possibilities that they opened. When she was 46, she did get married to Hugo Rumbold, who was a painter and scene and costume designer. But it was short-lived because he died within a year. And Zoe never remarried. Um, it was not necessary to her. She said, when I was 14, I decided never to marry. It's all some girls can do, I said, but I can write. Uh, Zoe is pictured on the right with her mother there. She had a long successful career. In addition to her plays and her screenplays, she was also an avid reviewer. She wrote poetry, she wrote novels. Her 1930 play, The Greeks Had a Word for It, was the basis for the 1953 movie, How to Marry a Millionaire. 
and her 1935 novel, The Old Maid, won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. She died on October 29, 1958 in Pasadena, California. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you everybody who, who joined us. Thanks, Jamie. And as she said, if you have any questions, please submit those through your uh, the Q&A toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom app. And we'll give it a few minutes if you have any questions. Okay, Jamie, I don't think any questions are coming through, um, but I'm gonna give a few remarks here at the end, but if you have any questions, feel free to submit those as I'm talking and we can always uh, you know, answer those before we end here today. But I do wanna thank you again to Jamie for sharing her work and research with us this morning. And thank you all for tuning in. As you may know, all three Missouri Historical Society's locations are reopened to the public. Safety is a top priority, and thus nearly all of our programming is virtually virtual right now. But the museum is open Wednesday through Sunday with several safety precautions in place, and we'd love for you to visit if you feel safe. Advanced reservations are required to visit all Missouri Historical Society locations. Please visit MoHistory, that's mohistory.org, to plan your visit and reserve your free tickets. Uh, lastly, I do invite you to join us this Thursday evening for our next uh, STL History Live at 6.30, and that will be African American Women in the Vote. What came next? So thanks again, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.